How to design a ship. Are you ready for this? Hello everybody, I am Nick the Naval Architect. How to design a ship? That is not an easy question. A student prompted this once with a different question. They wanted to know how to create a general arrangement drawing for the ship. But to create a general arrangement, you need to first design all the major parts of the ship. So the real question that the student was asking was how to perform a concept design. This is our term for the initial design phase, when we go from a blank sheet of paper to a sensible design for a ship, when you have nothing to start with. So here are my secrets revealed, how to design a ship. First a little clarity, that general arrangement drawing. This is the equivalent to the floor plan of a house. It doesn't show any specific construction details. It shows the major bulkheads, the general shape of the hull, floor layout on each deck. This is the starting drawing for any ship. It gets you oriented for anything else. It is also the hardest drawing to create when starting from scratch because it contains bits and pieces of every component of the entire ship design. It takes several rounds of trial and refinements to complete that initial process. The general arrangement drawing isn't until the end of these refinements. It's the end product, not the process. So let's talk about that process. Step one is the weight estimate. <laughs> I'm sorry to say it, but creation starts with boredom. Everybody wants to leap right into sketching out the hull shape and locating rooms for their concept design. I give into that temptation also. It's fun. I'll start with a few hand sketches. But hand sketches will not become the governing factor in your design. The biggest concern will always be the weight. A ship needs sufficient buoyancy. It has to support all of its weight. Okay, basic question, how much weight am I supporting? This controls the basic size of the ship, which means we can't even get a hull size until we know how much weight to support. Of course, there's a bit of a catch-22 there. One of the biggest weight components is the hull itself, which depends on the design of the ship. So we need to design the ship so that we can find the weight so that we can design the ship. Oh, that's a frustrating loop. So how do we break that loop? Take a guess. No, seriously. The first weight estimate involves educated guesses about the ship weight, usually based off of some other ship of similar size. Every naval architect has their own secret method. We use fancy words like parametrics and heuristic equations. These are all variations on educated guess, some of them better than others. And then with the next iteration, we will refine those guesses and divide the ship weight into major components, the machinery, the hull structure, the outfitting. And we're guessing at each one of those components with a little bit more precision now. This process continues through each iteration, adding more and more detail into our weight estimate, where we calculate where we're guessing at the weight of every component and adding it up. And each guess is more accurate than the last one because we have more information to go on. But the first iteration, that's always just a wild guess. On top of the ship weight, we also require the center of gravity. There are three dimensions to this, but we're most concerned with the longitudinal center of gravity, the LCG. Imagine that you create this massive deck house on the stern of the ship. It's six decks tall. That's a lot of weight to put on the back. How much did that shift the overall LCG? Did it pull it back one meter or two? That makes a big difference because if we have all of that weight back aft, we also need to compensate by shifting the center of buoyancy aft, making the hull wider at the stern because weight and LCG dictate the requirements for the hull shape. And there's no fast way around this. The LCG will come out as part of your weight estimate and weight estimates are tedium. 
just plain boring. The only way to do it is to go through every major item on the ship and guess at its weight. Not just weight. In addition to the weight, we also need to worry about the volume, the space required inside of our ship. Imagine that I have two ships. One carries a ton of steel and the other carries a ton of feathers. Now these both have the same weight, but the feather ship is going to need a lot more space for its cargo. So we need to estimate the volume required for everything that's going inside the ship. All the things we have to fit in the hull. One of the biggies, how much space do people require? Think about a normal house. There's a lot of space that's not currently occupied by a human. Lots of empty rooms. Or what about all the major equipment on the ship? How much space for the main engine? But what about all the supporting machinery that goes along with that engine? How much room do you leave for all of that? Well, those start to get tricky. And again, we turn to educated guesses for every component, every major room, and then we add up the total. Okay, we have our weight and our volume, or at least a starting guess for both of them. Now we can begin designing the hull shape. The weight controls the underwater volume of the hull, but a normal hull also includes a large portion above the water. The volume requirements, they control the total volume of the hull, the under and the above water sections. Now that only speaks to the general size of the hull. What about the shape? Well, naval architects use several different coefficients and different equations to give them hints about what the appropriate shape should be. But even without those hints, the general shape of the ship is always going to be a contest between competing needs. To minimize fuel consumption, we want the hull cross section to form a perfect circle and be as narrow as a needle lengthwise. But any ship that has that type of a shape is going to flip over the minute it touches the water. We call that capsizing. That's a bad day. Stability is the factor that stops it from capsizing. And stability competes to control the hull shape. There are two general cross sections that we favor to get good stability. Either you can go with a wide and shallow hull, we call those barges, or you can go with a deep and narrow hull. Of course, those two shapes are also the worst possible for powering. They generate the highest fuel consumption. So how do we solve this conflict? Compromise. We start with a stable hull shape, either wide and shallow or deep and narrow. And then we compromise by modifying that, trending towards that narrow needle shape. The trick lies with learning how close you can get to the needle and still maintain enough stability. Again, this is a process of guess and check. So I talked about the process of creating that hull shape, but how do we actually draw it? Enter the lines plan. A lines plan drawing shows the 3D shape of the hull. Just the shape, none of the construction details. This documents the size of the ship and the space available on each deck, along with the actual shape. Smooth curves is the main goal. But the trick lies in creating those smooth curves in all three dimensions, X, Y, and Z. Personally, I like to use dedicated software that's specific for creating ship's lines plans. This allows easier editing of the shape and includes some extra tools for to detect problem spots. Because any irregular curve or bump adds to the hull resistance. It increases fuel consumption. So when we obsess about creating that smooth hull shape, our real focus is the ship's fuel consumption. After we've made the lines plan, we need to check that hull shape by running it through our hydrostatics. So at this stage, we are just focusing on a few big points. First, check the buoyancy. Do we have enough to support the estimated weight? Or is it gonna sink straight to the bottom? Second, look at the longitudinal center of buoyancy, the LCB. This should match fairly close to the longitudinal center of gravity, the LCG. Remember, we estimated the LCG earlier. If these aren't matching fairly close to each other, your ship is going to trim forward and do a reenactment of the Titanic, pitching down. Third, we perform some basic checks on stability. Remember, stability is our ship's ability to not capsize. 
we're usually focusing on something called the metacentric height. The short way to say that one is just GMT. Just know that a GMT of zero, or a negative GMT even, that means your ship is capsized. Bad. We want a positive GMT, above zero, with a fair amount of margin even. But the exact requirements do change radically depending on your ship type and service. And those three things are what we're looking at with hydrostatics at the beginning. Will it float? Will it float relatively level? And will it not capsize? Hooray! We have finally gotten to the fun part. With the hull shape defined, we now have the envelope for our ship. It's time to finally create that general arrangement drawing and fit everything inside the envelope. You're going to start with the major structures first, and then work down to the minor pieces. The watertight bulkheads will form some of the most critical boundaries as you're laying things out. We carefully space these bulkheads to limit the effects of flooding. Once we've located those watertight bulkheads, we're going to start laying out the tanks, the cargo holds, and the engine room. Those will be our other major spaces in the ship's hull. While we're laying out all of these divisions and putting in all of these walls, we also need to coordinate between the different decks. Good structural design insists that major bulkheads need to align with each other from one deck to the next. So for example, the front of the deckhouse can't just land on open plate in somewhere on the hull. It needs to land on a bulkhead in the hull. This ensures adequate support for the deckhouse. The general arrangement drawing, it turns into a jigsaw puzzle, where you're trying to maintain alignment between all of these rooms and these structures. You even have to put in walkways so that people can get from one room to the next. Oh, good luck. I promise you won't get it right the first time. I do have one trick to make this go a little bit faster though. I like to start with hand sketches. Now I'm not the most artistic person, so my preferred technique is to start on the computer by creating a plan view, showing the whole outline at each deck level. I will then overlay a grid on top of that outline to ensure that I'll sketch things at a, the right scale. This computer drawing is my blank canvas. That's my starting point. I'll print that out on paper for each deck. From there, I take those paper copies and I hand sketch the layout of the ship. This is the fastest way that I have found to try different layouts and make different changes real quick. And you just keep trying different layouts until you're satisfied. The figure below shows an example of a hand sketch that I did from an experimental concept. And this probably demonstrates one of the most important lessons for hand sketching. Perfection is not the goal. It doesn't have to look good, as long as it makes sense to you. These are your notes to yourself. Once you're finally satisfied with the arrangement, then you redraw the entire thing in your CAD software of choice. That CAD drawing is now finally the formal general arrangement drawing. Congratulations, you now have a ship. Well, maybe. Oh, I'm sorry, did you think that you were done? That was just the first round. After that first round, you're likely going to discover that several items don't match. Maybe the hull was just a little bit too small with not quite enough buoyancy. Remember, this whole process started with educated guesses. And guesses tend to be wrong. So try again. Use your current design as a starting point and repeat the entire process. It normally takes two to four rounds of iterations to arrive at a feasible ship design. That's inherent to the process of concept design. Multiple iterations, guess and check. That's the way it works. Starting with a brand new concept requires a lot of trial and error. It'll take several attempts before you find one that's really good. This is why most ship designs copy each other, or they use heuristic formulas for their starting point, which is just a way of saying copy each other. You see, every heuristic formula uses data from past ships. So these formulas, they only tell you how to copy the previous designs. They don't give you any other insight. DMS takes an alternative approach to this. We developed an extensive design application called NeoShip. This is based on Excel, and it contains every aspect of a ship design all in one application. Most importantly, it avoids all those heuristic formulas. 
instead favoring to use simplified physics that still respect the dependencies between the various ship design aspects. We have the entire concept design process packed into one application. Well, that's wonderful for trial and error, but there's still hundreds of possible combinations when you look at all the major parameters for a ship design. So how do you pick the best option? Well, NeoShip employs a custom evolutionary optimizer, automated concept design. The optimizer works tirelessly through the night, checking hundreds of variations in design parameters to select the best options and then keep improving on those options. This approach allows DMS unparalleled flexibility when exploring all of the options for a new vessel design. The key advantages behind this are, number one, NeoShip goes into far more detail to check all of the critical aspects for a vessel design. Uh, number two, the evolutionary optimizer. That allows DMS to explore hundreds of variations, optimizing numerous vessel parameters. How do you know you ended up with the best design? because we checked all the others. And then number three, by using Excel as the main interface, DMS can easily adapt this application, adding new features like wind-assisted propulsion or new ship types. You got a new idea that you want to try out? We can incorporate it into NeoShip. And there was a great example of how this worked on a concept that I developed for a small container ship. With the evolutionary optimizer, I discovered that there was this huge advantage to going from six to seven rows of containers. All of my classic training in naval architecture had biased me to reject this option initially. I thought it would make the hull too wide, generate too much resistance, increase fuel consumption, so many bad things. All of those things did happen, but a whole extra row of containers generates far more revenue it justified the increased operating costs. I didn't see that option, but NeoShip has no bias. In the time that it took me to do one manual iteration, NeoShip had tested hundreds of possibilities, finding that unique and elegant solution. That was the power of automated design, the advantage of NeoShip. Okay, let's wrap this up. The genesis of a new ship design is never easy. Fraught with uncertainty, it begins with guesswork, and the guesses are often wrong. Programs like NeoShip improve this process, allowing far more iterations and design exploration, but even without NeoShip, the key to a successful design lies in the tedium. Focus on the weight estimate, the volume estimates. These can make or break a design. After that, repetition. Guess, check, and repeat. The general arrangement wasn't the start of this. It was the end point. And like so many achievements of skill, we see that end result of the general arrangement drawing, but not all of the diligent work that went behind it. Thanks very much. I am Nick the Naval Architect. Thanks for watching. I hope you found it interesting. So one of the things that really inspired me is that I was tired of seeing the same ship design with every single firm. DMS is trying to change your expectations for ship design. Think of a new way to make a more successful ship. That is the goal of a professional engineer. Check out the website and let's see what we can do to make your business better. Thanks very much.